This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've been in practice for over 25 years. And I started Self Work to reach people who are very interested in psychotherapy and psychological issues. To those of you who might have just been initially diagnosed and are looking for answers. And even to those of you who might not darken the door of a therapist but want to know more and might just be curious enough to listen to this podcast. So welcome to all of you. Before we get started, I want to thank all of you who are leaving reviews on iTunes or now for my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, on Amazon. Your words and you are my best publicity. I'm extremely, extremely grateful. Here's one from Cassandra that I was so appreciative of. This is on Amazon. I came across Dr. M and her podcast on the subject, again, Perfectly Hidden Depression, some time ago and found them enormously helpful and of great comfort to at long last make some sense of my life. The book encapsulates the concept in easy-to-read chapters, and the process flows. Most of all, I find Dr. M very gentle and compassionate in her manner, and her passion and dedication as a psychologist shine through. She stands out from the plethora of self-help books in a genuine, realistic, and practical way. Wow. Cassandra, I'm very, very touched, and I'm honored that the book has helped you in some way. I had someone tell me yesterday that it's not an easy book to work through because there are lots of reflections and exercises, really for anyone, not just for the perfectionist. So I hope that those of you who are reading it are enjoying it and learning something from it. And leave me a review to let me know. Today's self-work is about handling rejection in a relationship, whether it be a friendship or a partnership or even a marriage. But we're not just going to be talking about rejection. We're also going to be talking about feeling replaced when you learn that your ex has moved quickly on or maybe that the relationship or the other relationship was already in progress. We'll talk about the specific problems that rejection causes, but also replacement. For example, social media compulsion or or even obsessions, sexual insecurity, lack of emotional closure, and feeling even more out of control as your ex may want to commingle this new person with your children if you have them, if it's a marriage or a relationship. The solution takes time, as most grieving does. But we'll talk specifically today, again, I always talk about what you can do about it, about what I term reinterpretation or redefinition of the relationship. That's a technique that can help you move on, and it can help give you closure even when your ex won't participate in getting that closure, and that can be very hurtful as well. Our listener email is from someone from Sweden who used the SpeakPipe opportunity to tell me of her interest in perfectly hidden depression, but also brought up its potential place with spiritual problems, and I give her my thoughts. So today we're talking about rejection and when you feel replaced and how to work through those hurts and that grief. I'm so glad you're here, and I hope it's helpful. Many years ago, a really good friend of mine, my BFF at the time, ended what was then our 35-year relationship. I was 43 or 44 at the time, and we'd been kindred spirits since the third grade, sculpting our relationship like the one we'd read about between two girls in the novel Anne of Green Gables. We were going to get old together, and we always thought the other one was funny. We were going to forgive what needed to be forgiven, forget what was needed to be forgotten, and work through the rest. She was the only friend I invited to my third and obviously, I hope, final wedding for an obvious reason, because it was a very small, intimate event, but I wanted her to be there. She withdrew over about a year's period of time, and I chalked it up to being busy. She'd never been as good at keeping up as me. That was just part of our relationship. But when she started not returning calls, I was confused. We'd not had a fight. Her life had actually moved into a very positive direction, as had mine. It seemed to me that we had a lot to celebrate. In fact, years after the breakup, people would still ask me about her. They knew how close we'd been. 
But when it ended, she never gave me an explanation, or at least one that made sense to me, because she just said it was about her, but wouldn't be more specific. So I was left with feelings of being rejected for sure. I regrettably didn't handle it in the most healthy of fashions at first. I was very angry and hurt. But slowly I began to let go as well. And what I did was use this reinterpretation method that we're going to be talking about today. Actually, one of my redefinitions was to realize that she'd done the me that was a therapist a favor. I'd worked through the worst rejection of my life and I'd survived. So I really hope it's made me more sensitive to that particular topic in a different way than I perhaps could have been before. But when you're not only rejected, but replaced quickly, the sting can be immense. And the things it can easily lead to are very harmful, like bitterness, anger, and esteem issues. But let's first talk about rejection and the problems it can cause. Rejection occurs when one person who's been in a committed relationship takes control and ends that relationship. The message may be clear or maybe not so clear, but their actions show you you're no longer wanted in their life. Let's make sure we're talking about relationships that have been ongoing for quite a while, because that's when a sense of rejection actually can naturally occur. Now, you can perceive rejection after you've been out on a couple of dates, rather than realizing there wasn't a commitment in the first place. You may have fantasized that there was, but there actually wasn't. Now, this could lead to a complete discussion of newer trends like ghosting or benching, but I want to stick to the topic at hand. Committed relationships where there has been effort and sacrifice and working on things, that's the kind of relationship I'm talking about, where rejection means it's over for one of you, but maybe not for the other. The grief can feel overwhelming. You can feel a total loss of control if it's a surprise, or even if it's not. If you're married, even if you've thrown around the divorce word, it can still be shocking because you've grown immune to that kind of fighting. And now their bags are packed or you get a subpoena for divorce. There's a lot of grief to work through. You can be in shock. You can be angry. You can be sad. You can be afraid. There are many, many aspects of grief. And we've talked about those in other episodes. But let's touch on what's in front of you other than grief. First, fears of abandonment. Once you've been left, and especially if abandonment is part of your childhood history, you might enter new relationships with an intense sensitivity to being left again. Trust is a huge issue, and in fact, after the relationship is over, I often suggest to people that they date others far longer than they think they might need to. Because when you're falling in what I could term love lust, sometimes this fear doesn't emerge, this fear of abandonment doesn't emerge until all that newbie attention wears off and the relationship settles down into normalcy, then here can come the understandable fears of abandonment. Because it's not only trusting your new partner, it's about trusting yourself again. I might hear something like, I felt safe before. How am I supposed to trust my own gut as well as trust what my new partner or friend is saying? And this takes time. So many people don't want to take the time to allow these issues to emerge, believing instead, I'll love her or him through this. I'll show her that there are good men or good women out there. That may be true, but the person who's struggling with abandonment also needs to learn to trust themselves again, to trust their gut. And those fears of abandonment can be fierce. Second, there's tremendous insecurity, or there can be. After you're rejected, you don't feel attractive or smart or appealing. Whatever insecurities you have may come roaring to the front of the relationship. So it can take time and the support of friends and family to help you shore up your ego and get over the hurt. Anger and a sense of loss of control is the third. I hear things like, why do I have to start all over again? I've invested so much of myself. I put up with his mother. I listened to her talk on and on about how much she hated her job. I practically raised the kids by myself. All for what? So you're having to search for the meaning of all that. I've often used the analogy that it's like putting all your money in savings literally for years. And then finally it's time to go to the bank and start withdrawing. And the money is gone. You can be so angry. And that's when this reinterpretation method is vital. But we're going to talk about more of that. So you have to deal with anger and a sense of loss of control. The rug's been pulled up from under you, and you have to attend to that sense 
of anger. But the last is perhaps fear, especially fear of loneliness. Especially if you've been fairly dependent on your partner or friend or spouse, you're not quite sure that you can pull off life without them. You may have fears about finances, fears about parenting. And if there's been a lot of fighting, you might have also absorbed the message that you probably couldn't get along without them. So you have to slowly learn you can. While you're grieving, while you're angry, while you're building self-esteem, it's a lot. And so many of us, while in relationships, have lived in a coupled world. So even if your relationship wasn't all that great, you didn't feel alone. Now you have aloneness that isn't your choice. And so many of your friends have partners or are friends with other people. So you have to learn to steer your own boat while alone, at least for a while. Now let's talk about the sense of replacement when your partner or your friend goes on and establishes a very close relationship, even an intimate relationship with someone else. Replacement has its own set of issues. Here we're really talking about committed marriages or partnerships. The blow could be twofold. One, if you believe that the two of them were together prior to you finding out about the relationship, that can lead to questioning of how your partner felt about you. You have questions and questions and more questions. There can be such confusion about how many lies there were, how deep the deceptions were, how long those deceptions had been going on. And often, Your ex won't sit down with you anymore for those discussions because they're committed to someone else. And when that occurs, you're often left to try to find those answers yourself. This lack of emotional closure is something that so many people deal with, and it's very painful. Now, there are circumstances when your ex has moved on, especially if you were the rejecting partner, where actually that might feel all right because it makes you feel better about saying no to the relationship. But so often that's not the case. The second blow is to your own sense of self-esteem, as if you're a thing that can be replaced with someone else. You realize that that someone else knew about you way before you knew about them, most likely. And just how much of your life with your ex-partner did the other one even know about? It can feel demeaning and very vulnerable, like maybe someone being able to see into your house and you not seeing them. It can lead you to feeling as if nothing about your life is private. And you have to move through those feelings and figure out a way to detach from them and go on and create a new life that is now without your partner that neither one of them will really know about. But at first, you can actually even feel unsafe. So all of these feelings of replacement can quickly lead into social media compulsion, meaning you can't keep yourself from doing it, Or obsessions, meaning you can't keep yourself from thinking about it. And it's difficult to stay off of Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook to see what your ex is posting. If they block you, you can become a detective and find ways to see what's going on and get some sort of addictive pleasure out of the whole process. All of it only fuels anger and betrayal. And I've had many people tell me, I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I can't help myself. So it takes some real self-discipline to try to not find out the details. Again, it ties back into what we were talking about a few minutes ago, where your ex and their new partner knew about you, and so you almost need to know something about them. You can see how that can be a cycle. Then, of course, again, if we're talking about marriage and you have children, if your ex wants to bring this new person into your children's lives or even commingle their lives, here comes an avalanche of emotion. You can head to a lawyer's to try and stop it, where I guess you can stop cohabitation, but you usually can't stop their actual presence in your children's lives. All of that can be a very hard pill to swallow. You can try to talk to them reasonably to give your children time to adjust. But when the whole thing has been handled so suddenly, they may be driven by issues that they don't even see. So all of it can be very, very difficult and very painful. Now, all of this sounds as if the rejection replacement dynamic might be so devastating you'd struggle to ever recover. Yet, as I mentioned, there are some positive things to consider. In fact, I had a female client tell me this past year after having been extremely depressed and fearful about getting divorced. 
She looks back at the time where she was married, where she was dutifully taking his verbal slights and physical shoves to keep the marriage afloat. And now she realizes how good it feels for that kind of treatment to be out of her life. She's blossoming and feeling a lot more competent. So let's talk about this process of redefinition and reinterpretation. This woman had never called what she suffered abuse, and yet that's exactly what had happened to her. And as she reinterpreted and redefined, she could see that better. Let's go back to the example I used before about putting money in the bank for years, and then it's time to begin reaping the benefits of that long-term investment, but the money is gone. Obviously, you feel robbed, cheated, taken advantage of, miffed, afraid, sad, and broke, I guess. It's a myriad of emotions. But... What reinterpretation means is that since there's really nothing you can do about it but go on, in order to avoid bitterness or a sense of victimization from setting in, you can find the meaning of what all that saving was. Now, obviously, it would have made you feel more secure. But in order to avoid this sense of victimization, you can redefine or reinterpret the reason why you were saving in the first place. So the banking example is a metaphor for what I'm talking about. Let's say you gave four years or 14 years or 40 years to a relationship, and the relationship ends when you don't want it to. You're rejected. I always like to remind people that they're not only grieving the other person, they're grieving all the giving they did, their hopes, the dreams, the sacrifices. And so what you can do when you're ready is to redefine the relationship positively What did you learn? What was valuable about it? How are you different than you were when you began the relationship? Hopefully, you see what I mean. This doesn't preclude the fact that you have a lot of emotions to work through. But it is one way where you can do your best to not feel victimized by its ending. That stance would only cause you to be paralyzed emotionally. And that's the last thing you want. Or at least I hope it's the last thing you want. Instead, you want to move on, to move ahead. And just like the example of the female client I shared before, you want to find who you want to be in the now without the influence of someone who may not have been loving you very well for quite a long time. It's a reinterpretation, a redefinition that can be very helpful. Our listener email for today is a woman from Sweden who left a lovely message about her desire to translate my work on Perfectly Kin Depression into Swedish, which of course is very flattering, and I'm very pleased. But she had some concerns why spirituality is left out of the picture. She viewed perhaps some of the reasons for Perfectly Kin Depression as a lack of connection with others due to a non-engaged spiritual life. So here's her question. Hello, Dr. Margaret. I am a follower since recently, and I'm, um, among other things, translating interesting articles like yours about hidden depression into Swedish. I live in Stockholm, Sweden, and my question to you is why missing the spiritual part in your life also might cause depression being isolated from others in a sense that being with others still don't help from feeling apart from something. I think your article is excellent and I'm really happy to go on with it and talk more about it in Swedish. And I think it might be even better if you just mention a few words about God or belonging to something? It's a great question, and I really wanted to answer it. Long ago, when I began seeing patients, I made a decision about spirituality's inclusion in my work. Spirituality is obviously something that's very unique to each individual, and as a therapist, I've always believed it to be my job to try and understand and empathize with what my clients' religious or spiritual beliefs were. When I've worked with Mormons, I've asked them to bring me information to help me understand how their faith influences their partnership. I do the same thing with Judaism or Catholicism or from the Church of Christ or from atheism. Someone's spiritual life is an area where I try to be attentive 
Is it helpful to them, or is their concept of God or a divine being punishing, or is it affirming? How do their beliefs affect them? But I stop there. I don't share my own spiritual beliefs. If someone asks me about them, I will defer and refer them to a counselor of their own faith, as we both recognize that that knowledge is important for them to feel safe and secure, and that's fine. That's what's important to them. But the listener's point about perfectly hidden depression possibly being related to a lack of true connection with others through spiritual means is an interesting one. Unfortunately, I'd hasten to say that there are many actual faiths that would condemn people for talking about their sadness or their anger and give the message instead that they need to pray more or have a deeper faith. So to me, that's very dangerous territory. Perhaps in Sweden, their spiritual life as a culture is more liberal and accepting, and that would be wonderful. But perhaps this explanation can help her understand why I leave religion out of my writing. Not because I'm discounting its value to so many. I mean absolutely no disrespect. And then there's one more point. I've never studied religions or faiths. I can't advise on any level other than based on my own experience. So that's another reason why I stay away. I do not have a broad range of information about religion and faith. And, of course, my own faith in my work is already influenced because of my age, my gender, the color of my skin, my degree, my culture. And so I hesitate to add religion and spiritual matters into what is already, because I'm human, limitations to my ability to understand. To me, in many ways, the ninth characteristic or trait that's mentioned in my work on perfectly hidden depression, that being the felt need to always count your blessings, to rarely, if ever, allow yourself to grieve what may be the very underbellies of those blessings, is a nod to the religious spiritual community and life. Whatever the context, through school or church or neighborhood or group, I always encourage people to look for relationships that can be real and authentic and truly intimate. Thanks so much for a wonderful question. Thank you for translating my work. That is more than meaningful. I do have an announcement today. For the first time in three years, I'm taking a two-week vacation from the podcast. Actually, when I started the podcast, I didn't even realize that A lot of podcasts have seasons. (laughs) So my season has been 159 episodes long. (laughs) The next episode will then air January the 3rd of 2020. So I want to wish you a wonderful and meaningful holiday season. And I'll be back with you in 2020. Thank you so much for being here. Please continue to write me and ask Dr. Margaret at drmargaretrutherford.com to go on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com, to join me in my Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. I'd love to have you there. I'll be excited to be back with you. Thank you again for being here. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.